I w want to welcome you to my talk about RAUC evolution or maybe revolution of an update framework. Um, short notes about me. Uh, my name is Enrico Jöns. I'm uh, an embedded software architect, developer, whatever that is. Um, I'm the co-maintainer of the uh, update framework RAUC that I'm going to talk about today. And I work as an uh, integrator, system engineer at Pangotronics. For those who don't know Pangotronics, it's a company providing embedded Linux consulting and support um, for uh, customers from industry, automotive or whatever. And we work very closely together with uh, mainline projects, with the community and have uh, about uh, 6,000 patches also in the Linux kernel. So uh, short structure about what you're going to hear in the next uh, minutes. A short introduction for those who don't are familiar with RAUC. Um, then I'm going to talk about the initial bundle format, the update format of RAUC. And yeah, if there's an initial, there's also probably a new one. This is a Verity bundle format. And based on this, I uh, talk about the technologies that has, have been enabled by this new uh, update format. Um, it's uh, bundle streaming, it's uh, adaptive updates, encryption of updates, and at the end, if I don't run out of time, I will have uh, a short outlook of new features that are planned and have a, a short look about what is happening around RAUC in the community. So let's start with the overview. So the big picture of an update system uh, looks like this. So we have somewhere here our uh, build server that builds our embedded Linux system. And uh, from that embedded Linux system, then we generate our update artifact. And this update artifact is then uh, uploaded uh, somewhere on a deployment server, somewhere in the cloud. And the individual devices uh, in the field then fetch this update from the update server and install it. But um, there's not only this over the air update case, but there's still the older, let's say conventional approach of yeah, just using a USB stick and going to the device and updating it. So it's a, a use case that is still uh, very common uh, in some places. So RAUC, the scope of RAUC, the tool that we're going to talk about today is uh, mainly two things. So it's first of all, the uh, service that is running on the uh, embedded Linux target and handles the fail-safe installation of the updates. And the second part of RAUC is uh, the generation and the uh, signing of the update artifacts. So this is typically the last step that, ha that uh, happens in your embedded Linux generation builds uh, system. So when you build a Yocto image, the last thing is then, for example, that yeah, you generate an update bundle and RAUC also supports you with this. Uh, sh a few details or a few uh, key facts about RAUG. It's yeah, basically an embedded Linux update framework. Um, it is written in C code with using glib as a utility library with using OpenSSL um, for everything that uh, has done with crypto and for curl uh, for the network functionality. It's licensed under LGPL version 2.1. And yeah, we have it hosted on GitHub and all the community interaction also happens on GitHub. And yeah, what it basically provides is a face safe image based uh, atomic updating of AB system. So redundancy uh, boot interacting with the build loader and something like this. And it also handles the uh, cryptographic signing on the server side and the cryptographic verification of updates on the target side. So um, two things important to know when we talk about RAUC are the configuration files. So there's one configuration file on the target called the system configuration here on the left. And the system configuration provides basic information for the uh, RAUC update service, um, which, which bootloader it has to interact and uh, how the redundancy setup is. So um, we have a concept of uh, update uh, slots um, with uh, individual update targets and classes. Um, so you can say, okay, uh, I want to have an update for a root file system and then RAUC decides where uh, the exact slot uh, of the root file system is that should be updated. This is one part and the other part is on the right here. That's the configuration file in uh, the update itself. It's called the update manifest. 
So the container or archive used for updating in Rogue uh, we call uh, bundle. And yeah, here also some uh, basic information, uh, meta information like a version. And uh, the most important here, there's uh, a description of uh, what the purpose of the uh, images inside the update are. So this just as a quick idea of how that looks like. So the initial bundle format. Um, first of all, um, why we uh, do the verification and signing of the bundle format and why don't we use authenticated channels? So with authenticated channels, like you would do when using SSL to your server, you can be sure that your uh, update is not modified uh, during transport and you are sure that you're talking to the right server, but you're not sure um, that uh, what happens with your update artifact and on the server and you are not capable of using a USB stick, for example. So we have decided to use signed artifacts. There you've, you are free to choose to put them to whatever unsafe storage location you would like to, a USB stick or uh, whatever cloud service provider you might like to choose from. So um, the bundle generation in RAUC is uh, yeah, quite uh, easy. You just call uh, the RAUC bundle format, uh, RAUC bundle command with some options and what it basically does, it takes an input directory with all the artifacts that should be inside the bundle and the manifest as we have just seen. It creates a squash file system of it and uh, then it signs the entire squash file system and appends the signature um, to the squash file system. The signature uh, is based on X509 cryptography. We use OpenSSL methods for this. And the container format uh, we use is uh, CMS. And yeah, that's basically all we add a size uh, to uh, later being able to locate the signature. So on the target side, then what we do is when calling rock install, we use the uh, size I just mentioned to locate the signature. And then we uh, use the signature to very the integrity of the entire squash file system. And once we've in verified it, we can mount it and then we can uh, access the individual files. So this is a, a qu quite straight approach and um, the benefit of using SquashFS over any uh, archive is that we can directly mount it and don't have to unpack anything. But uh, a drawback of this is that we uh, have to verify the entire uh, squash file system once we install it. So that can be a bit slow. Another issue uh, came up when we were informed by a security research team. I think it was uh, in August 2020. And they informed us uh, that, they, uh, that we have a time of check, time of use vulnerability in RAUC. And uh, the short, short description is um, that we first verify the bundle. Then in a second separate step, we mount the bundle and in between we close the file descriptor of the bundle and also for mounting we invoked uh, the mount command. So there's time in between wherein the attacker could replace um, the bundle file. And also after having mounted, it was potentially uh, uh, able to modify the uh, actual bundle content. So yeah, this was uh, disclosed in, uh, in uh, December, 2020. Um, fixed in version 1.5. So what we did were two main mitigations. Uh, the first one was to not close the file descriptor uh, between the verification and the mounting of the bundle. And the second was um, to ensure that we, as a RAUC service, have exclusive access uh, to the bundle we're talking with. But yeah, this sh shows the limitation of the current format. And uh, together with these mitigations, we also developed a new bundle format uh, called the Verif uh, Verity format. And this was more or less a turning point for the project as this um, enabled a lot of uh, new developments based on this new Verity format. So what we're going to talk about next is the Verity format. So uh, a short background. Um, so almost all uh, storage devices in Linux are abstracted as block devices. So file systems operate uh, on top of block devices and yeah, then there are individual device drivers for the different storage uh, individually. And now there is the kernel device mapper. The kernel device mapper is an abstraction layer 
on top of a block device that uh, for the file system using it again looks like a normal block device but it is able to manipulate uh, data before accessing the underlying block devices. Um, you might know it from the logical volume manager or from the encrypt that you have uh, probably or hopeful on your laptops to uh, have full disk encryption. And yeah, there are a lot of different uh, device mappers available in the Linux kernel. Um, it's called the Verity format because we use the DM Verity kernel device mapper. So uh, DM Verity is for integrity checking of read-only block images. So uh, we create a hash tree for uh, verifying the block image. This works by uh, splitting up the block, uh, the block image into different blocks and we calculate the hash of each block and store the hash. And as soon as we have enough, enough uh, hashes that they fit into a block, then we again create a hash of this block. We do this procedure, that is why it generates a tree, until we only have a single, uh, a single block and then create a hash from it that we call the root hash. And this is uh, then our source of trust for DM Verity. So when reading from a DM Verity um, kernel device mapper, uh, you read a specific block. What DM Verity do does is it hashes a block and compares it to the hash it has stored. If that matches, then it has to verify the integrity of the block where the hash is stored inside. It again does hashing and comparison. So it does this down until the root block where it then um, creates a hash from and compares it to the root hash that we have stored somewhere separately. And if that matches, everything is fine. We can read the block. If uh, there is a mismatch, um, then we get an IO error. So this is the basic concept of DM Verity. So the new Verity based format um, is again created with a rock bundle command. The only difference is that in the bundle manifest we have here these uh, format equals verity. And the creation process is a bit different. We start again with the directory containing all the files, then create a squash file system, and then we uh, create our DM verity root hash that we append to the squash file system, and we pick the root hash and put it into a copy of the manifest extracted from the uh, directory. And what we then sign is only, uh, the, only the manifest. So CMS also allows um, putting this data that we sign inside. So yeah, the command is equal, but it's uh, very different when we uh, install the update. So the first thing is what we verify is only the inline manifest here. This is uh, much quicker than uh, having to verify the entire SquashFS. And then we can directly mount the SquashFS and install our data from this. Because yeah, using the Verity, we do the verification of the payload just on demand. So when we read the bundle, then the DM Verity uh, device mapper will verify the data on demand. So this provides fast initial verification and this also uh, prevents us from running into a time of check down of use vulnerability again, as we did before. So uh, a logical consequence of this was to implement bundle streaming. Um, what is bundle streaming? So normally when you install a bundle, you download the bundle to a data partition. So you have to have some extra storage where your bundle fits to. And then as a next step after having downloaded it, you install uh, the update to your device. So streaming, the idea of streaming is to just be able to write the update directly from the server to the target partition. So this is how this is uh, implemented in RAUC in yeah, a rough picture. So, um, First of all, for downloading, you don't want to use the RAUC service itself. It runs as root, downloading something as root is not such a good idea. So the first thing we do is uh, spawning an unprivileged helper process. And the unprivileged helper process acts as an interface. It plays a block device on one side 
and it communicates with uh, the server where the bundle is located on the other side. And then it uh, translates access to the block device to HTTP range requests to the server. And this allows us then to have uh, random access to the bundle that is located on the server. And as this is backed by DM Verity, we have also verified a random access to the remote bundle. And yeah, from the installation, it's just again very simple. You just call RAUC install and then the URL you want to install your bundle from. So yeah, as we use uh, libcurl, uh, this supports basically everything that libcurl also pr uh, supports HTTP version one and two, basic authentication, HTTPS, also with optional client certificates and custom HTTP headers. I don't want to go into details here, so you can have a look at this at the slides. Um, the next consequence when you are already able to download things from the internet is that we want to save download bandwidth because ba download bandwidth is uh, often quite limited or expensive or whatever. So uh, a conventional approach to this is using Delta updates. So what we understand as Delta updates, um, you might have uh, heard Stefano's talk earlier that day who also had a similar motivation. Delta updates um, produce a Delta binary or file Delta between uh, distinct versions. The drawback, the disadvantage is that you can just incrementally install. You can just move from one version to the other version with a Delta update. And so, yeah, we find this a bit inflexible, so we want to move between all versions possible. So this is why we have uh, made a concept called Drug Adaptive Updates. Um, the main idea behind this is that you have the original bundle and just add some metadata or generate some metadata that allow an optimized update of the bundle. So keep in mind we have the ability to perform random access so even if we pack additional content to the bundle we don't have to use it or download it. So how this looks like in the bundle manifest is uh, that uh, we have uh, an, for each image a list in uh, adaptive equals. Yeah, that is a proposal what uh, the update says it would support. Um, and then what is actually used from this is uh, or depends on the uh, RAUC service used. So let's take for example RAUC 1.8, it's not released yet, but just uh, will be the next version that supports only block hash index adaptive updates. So uh, if we have in our list um, two options here and block hash index is one of them, it takes the block hash index as optimization method and uh, everything is fine. And here for the application file system, it, don't, it doesn't know the adaptive mechanism, so it just uses a conventional update by copying the image. So um, yeah, we are fully backward compatible for whatever it, future adaptive update mechanism we add there. So um, already have, haven't spoken of it. So this is a basic concept how uh, adaptive block hash index update works. So we split up the update image into uh, several chunks of equal size. And for each chunk, um, we uh, create the hash describing the data. And then we put the hash sequently in a file so that we in the end have a file that unambiguously describes the data inside uh, the update. And you can use, uh, you can do this for the update itself. And you can do this also for your active partition where you currently run from. And you can do this also for your inactive slot or partition where you currently run from. And then an update works uh, when using this adaptive method by first of all, only downloading this hash index table. And then what Rauk does, it goes se sequentially through this hash index table and searches, first of all, in the local hash indexes here, if the, date, uh, if the hash is available there. And if it's available there, it copies the uh, data from the reference location 
on the block device to our slot that we want to update. If it's not available, only in this case, then we have to uh, fetch it from uh, the rem remote bundle. We make this again with a random access to the bundle with HTTP streaming capabilities. So uh, this works best with data, as these are fixed uh, blocks here. It works best with uh, data which is uh, aligned to 4K blocks. So for example, an export file system where all the files start at uh, 4K offsets. There it is a very good and uh, quite easy optimization for the download process. So similar to this, and this is also part of the outlook already because it's not yet implemented, is the tree rsync checksum method. It basically does the same but uh, uses uh, file checksums. So rsync, at least in patched versions, is uh, capable of um, generating and using checksums of files. So you can store this in either extended attributes or in a, a separate file. And then you can call the rsync command and just do the same as we already did. You say, okay, I take the active slot as reference. I take the inactive slot, which is also the update target as reference. And uh, then I take the, uh, the remote bundle as a search reference. And then I just perform an rsync update. And it, yeah, if it finds files locally, then it fetches them first and uh, only the files that are not available locally, either in the active or inactive petition, have to be fetched from the remote server. And we could also then combine this with the former Delta approach, where I said it's not so optimal, but we can, for common versions, add uh, distinct Delta versions to the bundle. And uh, then, yeah, if the version we're going to install from or to match a delta in the bundle, then and, uh, the adaptive method can just use this delta instead of uh, using the original image. So a next feature based on the DM Verity uh, bundle format is encryption. Encryption was often uh, required by, uh, by our customers and by the community, but uh, yeah, not easy to implement with the original bundle format. So the motivation is quite clear. Sometimes you have uh, sensitive data in your, up, uh, in your updates or uh, sensitive application or some sort of intellectual property. So um, this you want to protect. And uh, normally um, the generation of the updates, so uh, the generation of the update artifacts happens inside your build server or inside the CI. And the actual uh, encryption or the handling of uh, different individual devices and uh, the deployment that have, happens in a different entity. So the encryption process in RAUC is split up in two parts. One, which is what the CI or the build server uh, emits, it is a payload encryption. And then you have the individual descript, uh, encryption for the individual recipients uh, based on whatever devices are out in the field. So yeah, we use another kernel device mapper now. So this time dmcrypt, the one that you know from your laptop. And yeah, this is just quite simple. So we don't use it for the generation. For the generation, um, we just uh, generate a random key. And then it's uh, symmetric cryptography. So um, we split the image into blocks of equal size and um, encrypt each block individually and concatenate them again together to an encrypted image. So for the decryption, then uh, dmcrypt comes into play. So when uh, you read a block from the device mapper, what happens hidden by dmcrypt is uh, that it reads the uh, exact block from the encrypted image and uses the symmetric key for decrypting it and providing you the decrypted version of it. So there's not much magic involved. Here's a two-step process. So in the manifest, you see it's, uh, again, only the difference that there is format equals script. And what this does is uh, creating a squash file system as we have before, had before, but now it also encrypts the squash file system. And the crypt key, the symmetric one, 
is stored inside the manifest, just what we already did with our uh, root hash for the invariant team. And yeah, with this, we have an encrypted payload, but we have an, uh, yeah, here, the uh, crypt key unprotected currently. So then the next step, when we want to encrypt for the individual recipients, we call rock encrypt. And there you can choose if you have one recipient or if you have 10,000 of recipients. And uh, what it does is just taking the signature CMS that we have before um, inside an encryption CMS. So uh, we yeah, basically encrypt the entire signature that we had before. And then we can, with CMS, yeah, just add hundreds or thousands of individual recipients there. Uh, it's only limited because some, sometimes your CMS structure grows quite large. So, but in theory, you can have uh, very many different recipients. On the device side, then there's many just one thing needed. You have to have in your system configuration file, the one that is on the target, um, you have to specify the key and the certificate uh, required to decrypt the update can be a file, it can also be a PKCS11 URI. And as we combine here DM Verity with DM Crypt, we then have authenticated encryption of the bundle. And as this everything works block-based, with it's also um, compatible with streaming. So you can uh, just stream an encrypted bundle to a partition. So yeah, the typically use cases one could use this in, in is uh, just, yeah, the simple one is a shared private uh, or a shared encryption key. So uh, one to rule them all, this is yeah, basic security, I would say. So if the key is compromised, then uh, it's compromised for all devices out there. Uh, but you don't have to secure um, your key so much. Um, a bit better approach is to use uh, group keys so that you form different groups of your devices and uh, assign them each a different key. Then if one key is compromised, uh, it's only uh, the group of devices that gets compromised. The ideal case would be to use per device keys. Um, then it's possible to revoke them uh, per device. And But then if you have individual keys, you also have to take care of securing them individually. So putting them into a trusted platform module, an HSM or a trusted execution environment or whatever. So a short outlook of future things that uh, we have planned in Rauk and uh, things that happened in the community as promised. So we have some metadata in our update manifest. So the compatible is mandatory, but the rest is uh, optional. So you can put a description and you can put a version in the build ID or something like this. But for some use cases, this is insufficient when you want to make some high level decisions about whether to use this update or not, or what's the purpose of it. So um, there was a request to have the ability to add, to add additional metadata. So uh, one of the future versions of Rauk then um, will support um, the metadata sections that are not interpreted in, by Rauk in any way. They are just forwarded uh, via the DBoss API or uh, via Rauk info. And uh, yeah, they then allow the vendor to put additional information in and to evaluate this information and yeah, do whatever he wants with it. Uh, another thing is uh, his, uh, installation history or event looking. So what we have so far in RAUG is a status file that is here on the left side, which uh, gives some basic information about what was installed last on the device. So uh, what kind of bundle, when what is, was it installed, when was it activated? Um, but yeah, there was a request to have uh, more and configurable locking of what happens inside RAUG and uh, also to have a history of all installations that happened in the lifetime of the update service or of the device. So this is also something that will be yeah, done in the next or the, the release after, I guess. Um, 
And another feature is uh, lifecycle handling. So the, currently, the scope of RAUG is mainly just uh, the current installation. So it is good in installing things, and uh, after reboot, you can mark your uh, your just installed system is good. But there's no high-level perspective and tracing between what update we installed and which update after reboot we marked successfully. It's not a big issue, but it's uh, nice if you have a deployment server uh, that really wants to know if the update he just installed is, is a running one. So the idea is to have uh, what we c would call life cycle handling. So um, it, we generate uh, an ID when starting the installation, and uh, then we use this ID written to a file or whatever to trace the inst uh, entire installation procedure until the reboot of the system. And then we can uh, emit via DBoss, for example, a successful installation upon the next boot. And what's also uh, possible or should be possible with this is then to add a, a capability of adding confirmation. So like when a user has to approve an update or something like this. Um, also, yeah, via the idea and the DBus interface. And there are yeah, some more things to do. So having multiple signers um, for the eight artifact or MFN signatures, this is well supported by both uh, OpenSSL and the CMS structure, but yeah, it has to be implemented um, either by the community or project driven. Um, we have had, had a long history of re um, requests about application or container updates. So I want to update my application uh, without having to update the root file system each time. So yeah, we have developed an initial concept for this. Uh, it uh, would exceed the scope of this presentation, but for those who are uh, interested in, it is available on this GitHub issue. And other nice things uh, are planned like streaming upload from browser so that you can click in your browser, upload a bundle, and then RAUC interacts directly uh, with the browser to, up, uh, to download on and install it without intermediate uh, storage required. Or to have a simple deployment server. There are things like Hawkbit out there, but these are quite complicated. Um, for most use cases, uh, a, a simple deployment server would be sufficient. So uh, yeah, this is something we would also like to add, not in the RAW core, but in the RAW organization. Um, speaking of it, uh, for those uh, who now want to uh, incorporate with uh, Hawkbit, which is one of very few open source deployment services available, um, there is the RAW Hawkbit updater, um, which is uh, a project that was initially developed by Prevas and moved into the RAUC organization in 2020, and we did a lot of refactoring, fixing, cleanup, and adding new features. And uh, yeah, the current lease is 1.2, and it's uh, yeah, a quite uh, handy way of interacting with um, the Hawkbit uh, deployment server via the REST API on one side, on, and with RAUC, the so deepest API of RAUC on the other side. Another thing I can highly recommend is the MetaRAW community layer that was uh, initialized and is still maintained uh, by Leon Anavi, thanks to him, if he can hear us. And uh, yeah, it's basically um, a Yocto uh, or Bitbag layer collection for example integrations of different platforms. So uh, for example, we have uh, an in example integration for a QMO-based platform also for uh, Raspberry Pi, Sunshi, and Tegra. And yeah, it's just an example of how to use RAUG, but it's a very good starting point. So we also have um, built tutorials on top of the QEMO platform, because it's a yeah, starting point where you don't need any hardware. And yeah, so feel free to use it. And the link is uh, below uh, left here in the slides. And also contributions for new platforms or extending the current support is highly recommended. And uh, an outlook or a, a look into the community. And yeah, it's always for a project hard to know where, or for an open source project at least, hard to know where your software is actually used. Uh, so yeah, I have to say we were quite a bit proud to hear that uh, RAUG is the update service used on the uh, Valve Steam Deck. 
and that's uh, used together with the async. For those who know at least the async, this is the Go variant of uh, the async, the content chunking tool uh, from the systemd universe that Rauk also has support for and uh, Collabora who did the integration of uh, Rauk and de sync for the Steam uh, deck also contributed these patches back and I think they are already merged now or finally merged and will be in the uh, next release and other projects uh, that uh, use Rauk or that we know that use Rauk uh, this uh, home assisting operation system where they have yeah, a, a build root based system where they use uh, Rauk to update us and the Oniro distributed platform project uh, also uses Rauk as part of its uh, SysOta update mechanism. So I wonder why I am in time because I didn't manage to uh, make it in 40 minutes ever. Um, <laughs> so thank you for your attention and yeah, I think we still have time for questions. And uh, for those who can't uh, ask anything right now, there's also a Rauk IRC or Matrix channel available where we are happy to discuss with you. Thank you. All clear, fine. <laughs> or too tired. Original image, it's hard to know that the original image that you're trying to update is broken. Uh, and normally when you do an update, you're sure that the new thing that you wrote is, is good. Um, but with the Delta update, you, you kind of rely on the original is still okay and uh, I'm not overwriting it. But here, because you're actually checking the hashes of the original, you're still sure that that uh, what you write is 100% is okay. So I'm... Um, just want to yeah. indicate this that this is a very good way of making sure that Delta updates are still reliable. Um, so the Delta uh, that I was talking about was uh, generated on the server side. So I would assume that we know that the bundle on the server side is okay, and what is written on the uh, on the target side is still uh, or can be understood as a full image update. Yeah, this is what you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's Thank a question. You. If we're going to go for it. I mean, we <laughs> maybe, have, uh, maybe have too many. Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, one, one thing I, I noticed with your system, so it looks really cool, but the the uh, let's say bundle is encrypted or has GM Verity, right? But then once you install it on a target, it's not encrypted, and you don't have GM Verity, right? You would have to then <laughs> basically encrypt the partition or have a Ver Verity blob or whatever on top inside the bundle. So, so the bundle is encrypted and yeah. uh, it uses uh, the Verity uh, implementation of the target. And uh, But once you install it on the flash, it's no longer encrypted. No, it's okay. not the intention to have it encrypted. On, that's a different uh, problem to solve. So if you want to have uh, authenticated boot or an encrypted partition, that is a problem of orthogonal to uh, what we do during transportation. So this is only for the transportation part. You can do DM uh, integrity or uh, DM verity on your target, um, then you just have a file system, for example, um, or a, a block image, which the hash three appended, you just install it as a normal image that is transparent to what Rauk does. And same would apply uh, if using encryption. So yeah, then it depends on which type of encryption you use, if it, uh, it's done by the file system layer or the block uh, layer, so yeah. Oh, thanks. One minute. So with the Delta updates being calculated at the block level, so beneath MK squash FS and all the compression, practically speaking, what numbers of savings do you see? Because typically if there's just one file that gets changed one byte, with all the compression going on, it's gonna be more than one byte being changed. 
Uh, so what are the, the real numbers that you see in practice when not much files are changed? But yeah, how that impacts the amount of Delta updates that have, been, that have to be done? Um, we have not massively tested. We have tested this in some cases where we've changed only our parts of the uh, file system. It's not as ideal as Delta updates are. It's not as ideal as, um, as for example, CA sync is uh, with it synchronizing hashes. Um, but if you uh, tune your SquatchFS and your uh, X4 file system and so on correctly, um, then the saving is uh, yeah qu quite notable, I would say. Okay. Not to say massively. Thank you. Yeah. We're done. Thanks, Thanks a lot. <laughs>